Well, welcome to today's event, uh, Experience Halt West Coast, United States. Um, during the session, you'll have the opportunity to hear from Molly Angelo, our um, Director of Enrollment at Halt, uh, Professor Matt Fisher, who is a professor on Halt San Francisco campus, and three of Halt's current students and ambassadors who are right here, uh, Nicola, Sophia, and Ak Akalish. Um, they'll be available to answer any questions that you may have about you know day-to-day -day life as a student at Holt. Um, so before we begin, we'd love to do just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, a recording of the webinar will be sent out to everyone via email in the next couple days. The session will last roughly one hour or so, and this is meant to be really interactive. Um, feel free to ask questions, and really we want you to be able to get an idea of what it's like to be a student at Holt. Um, so if you do have a question, please utilize the chat function um, or the Q&A function. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I would now love to hand this over to Molly, who will tell you a little bit uh, about our programs. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Brooke. And, and thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, I'm Molly Ansello. I'm the Director of Enrollment here at Holt International Business School in San Francisco. We're really excited to have you all here for our Experience Holt event, where we hope that you will get the whole Holt experience, although virtual, um, there'll definitely be some, some elements of today's discussion and today's experience that really mimic the in-person experience at Holt, as well as our, our virtual classes. Um, so you will notice during today's session that um, it's, it's very discussion-based, and that's something that we, we really value at Holt. You do a, a lot of kind of group work and presentations, discussion-based based learning, dynamic ideation, and um, that's something that you will be led through today with Professor Fisher, as well as our, our great current students that we'll have to help lead that discussion. Uh, another exciting aspect of HALT that you all probably noticed is our internationality. Um, international is in our name and it's something that is a part of our DNA. It's a part of our values. Um, we have over 160 nationalities here at HALT. Um, your class size itself would be probably around 60 students with maybe 40 nationalities represented there. Um, so not only is this a very discussion-based uh, experience, but an opportunity to really learn from different perspectives from around the world and, and really build your creativity innovate, and innovative instincts um, out of that. Um, you also may know as a, a part of Holt's internationality that we do have six campus locations globally. So uh, as Brooke mentioned, Professor Fisher and myself are located in San Francisco. We have a campus location here as well as in Boston and New York in the US. Um, and then uh, global campuses in London, Dubai and Shanghai. So the beautiful thing about the program at Holt is that you can rotate to these different locations obviously great for all of us that are stir crazy during the, the pandemic to, you know, once this is all over, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to get out and um, the program does offer you the opportunity to see as many of these campuses as you'd like. So it's a, a great personal opportunity for you to travel, but the real benefit is that it allows you to build a global network of business contacts and potential employers as well. So what programs do we offer? Um, and I, I see some of you on here that I'm already working with. So it's really great to, to see you all here. Um, you probably know this information, of course, but for those that are not familiar with the programs, we have a number of one-year full-time master degrees. So our master in international business, uh, master in international marketing, master in finance, and master in business analytics. We also have a part-time virtual master in business analytics and a hybrid master in business analytics, which means it's half in person and half online. Um, in addition, we do have an MBA program, an executive MBA program, a virtual um, MBA program and a hybrid MBA program for those that do have um, a bit more experience. Um, so lots of options to, to fit whatever you're, you know, you all are looking for. And then we also do have a dual degree program, which is an opportunity to get two of these master degrees in as little as a year and a half. So a great way to set yourself apart. Um, and lastly, we do want to make you all aware that Holt truly believes in continuing education. 
because your growth does not stop once you graduate. Um, so we offer our alums an opportunity for lifelong learning. And what that means is that as an alum at HALT, you are entitled to take one free elective course every single year for the rest of your life. So I'll let that sink in a minute. <laughs> um, it's our way of investing in you for the long term, for the entirety of your career, not just the year or year and a half that you're with us. We really want to make sure that you stay the most relevant and competitive professional out there in the market um, for the, the entire length of your professional career. And that's the way that we support you in that. So keep that in mind as you are, you know, looking at programs and consider, and, excuse me, considering the return on investment. So with that, I will wrap up my overview and we'll get on to the portion of the evening that I know you all are excited about, which is the case study. Um, just before I, I pass the reins to our Professor Fisher, I do want to mention one other thing that really makes HALT very unique and special, and that is our professors. Um, at HALT, we have you know, very, very um, talented individuals that all come from a business background. So we don't have you know, any pure academic professors here. All of our professors really have real practical hands-on experience because our goal is to make sure that you are the most relevant professional. Um, so that is the uh, leaders that we provide for you in the classroom as well. So Professor Fisher is no different. He comes to HALT with an impressive background in marketing and management, operations, economics, international business, um, and has himself actually started several successful real estate and financial service businesses as an entrepreneur. Um, he's taught at a number of uh, colleges here in the Bay Area and joined HALT about a year ago, um, focusing his research and publication on case studies the most recent of which we will look at today. So with that, I'm gonna to toss it to you, Professor Fisher. And once again, thank you all for, for being here today. I will put my um, details in the, the chat box for anybody that hasn't applied yet. If you are interested, would love to talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks. Well, thank you for such a gracious intro, uh, Molly. I appreciate that. Um, so yes, the uh, case study that we're going to discuss here today is on Peloton Interactive. And I'm hoping that you at least have some topical exposure to Peloton as a company. Um, and we're basically going to focus in on kind of one uh, dimension to the case study that I uh, recently uh, wrote and uh, have published. And so um, and I think it's pretty accessible here. So let me go ahead and just share the screen real quick. Okay, so our discussion is going to be centered on uh, Peloton, the fitness technology company uh, that has made their the core kind of flagship product is their spin bike uh, with a kind of a monitor attached to the front that allows them to stream class content right onto the bike itself. And specifically, we're going to be looking at kind of the pricing strategy that underpins uh, Peloton and really kind of looking at and considering kind of the strategies behind that, who that they're actually trying to uh, market themselves to, and also perhaps answer the question, is it too expensive? Um, and so first and foremost here, I'll uh, say welcome to the Peloton. So oftentimes not known, uh, where does the name Peloton come from? It's actually a cycling term. In fact, in something like the Tour de France or something, when you have a large contingent of uh, cyclists that kind of clump together, that's actually called a Peloton. Um, and so that's what the Peloton term means is it's a group of riders. So already in the name, uh, we have a product that is intended for home use. However, uh, just within that name, there is built into this an attempt to try to facilitate a group dynamic or a feel or an experience as though you are alone yet with others. And so uh, that's what the Peloton comes from. So ultimately, we want to ask ourselves, whenever, we're enter whenever we are launching a new product, um, what, what are we going to price it at? Uh, and there's a lot of thought that goes into uh, pricing. And, that, and so we're gonna look at that here. And we wanna understand first and foremost that pricing isn't just the number that we slap on the product or the service. Pro, uh, pricing signals 
things. It tells us things. It communicates a lot. And I think one of the one of the best ways to kind of illustrate this is just to ask yourselves here. If you've traveled to another country and you've noticed that there are brands that you're unfamiliar with, how did you determine whether the product was any good or not? And I think back to my own uh, graduate studies, I studied in the south of France for a little while and I remember going and looking at uh, some of the jewelry displays as I was thinking about buying a watch and there were a number of brands that I had just never heard of. I mean, of course there was the Rolex and the, you know, the big brands that we, that we know of, but there was a whole host of brands I had never heard of before. And so if you're not familiar with the brand, what do you rely upon? Well, price. Uh, there was one brand I thought it had a, a pretty nice looking watch and uh, I looked at the price and it was significantly less expensive than the rest. And so what did that signal to me? It signaled to me that you know maybe that watch wasn't as very high quality. Maybe there was something wrong with it. I wasn't really sure. And in fact, I then later uh, went to my friend Alessandro, who's from Italy, and he's like, "Matt, no, don't buy that one." That's as close as I can do to Alessandro, which uh, he thinks is pretty funny when I chat with him. Uh, <laughs> so the so pricing means something, and so a lot of thought goes into pricing and the strategy that underpins that. And so the next thing we want to think about is what is this product? And so we want to make a distinction between what is a spin bike versus a stationary bike. And this is particularly important because if you're not, if you've never done a spin class before, or you're not familiar with a spin bike, you might be thinking to yourself, well, isn't that the same thing that I found for like $25 at a garage sale? Um, most likely, no, most likely that was a stationary bike that's not really intended for really heavy, rigorous use. That's your kind of standard exercise bike. And this standard exercise bike has had a long history. It's been around for a really long time. And because of that, it influences when investors were looking at Peloton, how excited were they about this company? And why can you oftentimes find a standard stationary exercise bike at a garage sale for next to nothing? Because for, for a lot of individuals, they have these lofty goals of being fit and, and exercising at home. But once they actually buy the product themselves, they find out that like, hey, I need to hang my clothes up after I've washed them. I don't want them to go through the dryer. And what am I going to hang them on? Uh, maybe, the, maybe the bike. Um, and so oftentimes exercise equipment becomes a really expensive place to hang your clothing. Um, and so they don't get used. And so they ultimately end up at a, at a garage sale. But a spin bike is a much more robust product. It needs to take a beating. It is expected that it is going to have very heavy use. And so the quality of a spin bike are, is, is significantly higher or, or again, more, more robust than a regular stationary bike. So we already have two kind of classifications of products here. A stationary bike, because of the fact that it is not built to take the beating of a spin bike, probably ought to be less expensive than a spin bike. Again, because of just how it would be used. But of course, that's not always a given. But in a, in a way of kind of approaching this from a general sense, that does seem to kind of fit that narrative. So first off, if you don't have a background in uh, marketing, and I don't expect that you do, uh, we have a couple of kind of standard pricing strategies that are very, very common. So the first one is, the, is probably the most uh, straightforward, about well, the first two are the most straightforward, and that is cost plus. So what is the cost of goods sold? What does it cost me to build the product? And I want to make a certain margin on that. So if it costs me $100 to build the product and I want to make a 10% margin, that's pretty low, but um, then I would say, okay, well then I'll price it $110. The $10 is my profit, the rest of it goes in there. So I kind of lock in a certain margin that I want. Now this particular pricing strategy tends to work pretty well if you're going to be a firm that's going to move a lot of product and you want to dominate the market by being low cost. So Walmart, Costco, these types of places are more often uh, likely to employ a cost plus strategy uh, of pricing in which they're just going to say, hey, this is the margin that we're going to make. And how are we going to make a lot of money? We're going to sell a lot of product. Um, but this is not really a particularly good approach for a lot of other products and services. So then we have competitive pricing. 
Now, competitive pricing is where you oftentimes will look at a market and you will then start to clump or look at strategic groupings. And so I, I'll make a silly example here. You would never expect a Chevrolet to be priced similar to a Ferrari. And in fact, I'm trying to make an absurd example because they're so clearly, yes, they're both cars, but they're not even really competitors to each other. So with competitive pricing, you oftentimes will think about the product, who are your competitors, look at the pricing that they're charging, and then say, is my product about the same? Is it a little, is it maybe a little bit better? And how is it better? Okay, so I'm going to price mine a little bit more than my competitors. So you are looking to the marketplace and looking at relative price to justify how you how you set that. Skimming and penetration pricing, this is probably most common with technology companies uh, is, is the one where we see it the most. You first introduce a new high-tech product that everyone's kind of excited about. And for me personally, I don't know if you guys have seen this one just the other day, uh, there's a company in, in uh, the United Kingdom that is doing a robotics company that can uh, uh, make, uh, make food for you. And they want to charge 248,000 pounds for this kitchen robot. Now, if it weren't for the 248,000 pounds, I would be like, here, just take my money. Uh, get me that kitchen robot stat. <laughs> I want that thing immediately. Now, who can afford a $248,000 kitchen robot? Uh, not this guy, but apparently they are reporting that they have a thousand orders for that right away. So this would be kind of an example of skimming in that you introduce the product at a very, very high price with the idea that there are many individuals who have a lot of resources, you know, wealthy individuals and sometimes individuals who have more money than cents. Um, and they're like, hey, yes, I'm willing to pay that high price. And, and so you tap out the number of people that are capable of paying that price. And then you slowly bring the price down as you move the product more into the mass market. And so that's just a lot of your tech companies. Again, they introduce a product, real high price for the early adopters. Once they get it and they need to go more mainstream, the price comes down as they reach scale. We also have penetration pricing. Penetration pricing is, let me go ahead and set the price really, really low. In fact, in many cases, way below my competitors. So many of your subscription startup companies, subscription meal planning and whatnot, they will sometimes do penetration pricing of, you'll sign up, um, you know, really, really, it, oh, Tim, Tim's a chef. So, okay, Tim's not interested. So Tim, you are welcome at my home anytime, my friend, anytime. Because uh, uh, I have some friends in the hospitality industry that, that like to cook. And finally, I admitted to them much to my own shame. I don't like cooking. <laughs> I'm not good at it and I don't like it. Um, so penetration pricing. I might offer my product at a loss just to get you on board. Again, particularly subscription-based companies. They'll, they wanna offer a really low price so that you don't, you don't have a hesitation about signing up for it. Hopefully you'll be happy with the product or the service and you stick with it. So in penetration pricing, sometimes I like to joke you, that you are buying the market. Um, you're gonna come in at a really, really low price to capture. The last one here, and this is part of what we're kind of gonna focus in on here today is value-based pricing. And this is, let's get consumers to pay for the benefits that they value. And what would they be willing to pay for that? And let's use that as the basis to set our pricing. Now, value-based pricing is probably one of the most effective pricing strategies out there. However, it's also one of the more difficult ones to apply because we need to know who our consumers are. And if we don't know who our consumers are, you're going to have a really hard time coming up with what to actually price your product at. So Peloton is in the fitness space. They're kind of known as a uh, fitness tech company. And in the fitness sphere, we have, a, we have a crowded marketplace. You have a number of different fitness formats that you can get fitness services from. You got individual spas, um, even from our, our SF campus, uh, we have just across the street, um, there's a pretty high-end gym and spa that's available and that, that it's really, really nice, also a little expensive. Um, and then you have your regular standard gyms with lots of equipment, even down, of course, then to the boutiques, which I think most of you are familiar with. Those could be your Pilates studios, your yoga studios, their CrossFit, um, all the, in fact, uh, even Orange Theory Fitness is another good example. And then, of course, we have the home equipment. So for those that want to maybe not have to pay some of the, the prices that are associated with going to the gym, 
Um, and so let's have the equipment at home. Now, we want to recognize and understand that most individuals, if you were to ask them whether they want to be healthy or not, of course, they're going to say yes. And you would say, you know, do you want to be fit? Of course, they're going to say yes. But the challenge for most individuals is recognizing that how do we actually develop lifestyles and habits that we can stick with? I'll be the first one to tell you that, yes, I do happen to actually own a Peloton. Clearly, I'm not using it enough. Um, and so, I mean, I, I will freely admit to you that I have one of these things. I think it's great. But at the same time, there is a challenge in developing habits that we can stick with. So in the gym space, oftentimes gyms are constantly very aggressively trying to recruit new members. Why? Because lots of people sign up but they have a very high defect rate, a very high churn rate. So people, so the, the example I have here on the slide, you know, everybody says around December 31st, um, you know, hey, this is the year that I'm going to finally get that six pack. And then you, and then you have a friend or a partner who says, yeah, but what about the last five years that you've been claiming you're going to get that five, that six pack? And you're like, well, maybe the sixth year is a chart. Okay. Sixth year, six pack. It's going to work out this year. And by March, what happens? Doesn't happen. So you go to the gym, the place is freaking packed. But then by March, there's like tumbleweed blowing through the place. And so, oh, Tim had a Peloton. All right. Um, okay. So, Peloton, so Tim actually is, is going to, you're going to be happy, Tim. I'm going to speak to your experience here in just a couple of slides. So you're, you're right on here with me. So the idea is we want to understand is, is that it's not just about selling a piece of equipment. It's also about that we need to develop new habits. And so we have uh, research in, behavior, in, in psychology and consumer behavior that in many cases, the research supports that takes somewhere between 21 and 60 days to develop a habit that will really stick with you. So if you think that you're gonna change that lifestyle and you, and you stick with it for five days, sorry, you got at least 16 more to go in which you need to stick with it. For a, for a habit to start to become where, where your body mentally and physically starts to crave that workout or expect that workout. Less than that, it's really easy to lose interest, which is why so many of those stationary bikes end up at the garage sale or the gym membership. People don't stick with it long enough. They always have the best of intentions, but by March, it's just not happening. So how do we market? So one of the fundamental frameworks for marketing, and some of you have a marketing background, you're familiar with this. If you don't, that's okay, is STP. We segment the market to understand that we have different types of consumers. We then target, we choose, we target the customers that we want to appeal to, and then we're going to position our offering to be appealing to those consumers. And this is kind of a rejection of kind of an old, extremely outmoded way of thinking that some people still believe things like the customer is always right, or if you ever ask a business, you're like, who are your customers? And, and, and it's... It's, it's kind of somewhat sad and unnerving a little bit. I mean, sometimes if you have a small business owner, you say, who are your customers? They're like, anyone who walks through the front door. You're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not anyone that walks through the front door. Because with many firms, when they try to satisfy everybody, they end up satisfied. They end up not really pleasing anybody. And if you try to make everybody happy, well, then you're a prime target for a competitor to, to pick some little segment of, of consumers and steal them away from you by making them happier than you can make them by trying to make everybody happy. So this one comes right over to Tim here. So in the very earliest days of Peloton, they initially priced the bike at around $1,200. But when they did that, they were finding that demand for the bike was actually not very robust. And what they had found was that consumers pricing signals something. So at $1,200, people assumed that the bike was not a very high quality. And you know, when you start, if it, it's one thing if you have something that's really, really inexpensive. We call this a, a low involvement product. So if there's a new candy bar out and you want to give it a try and it's only like a dollar, you know, it's no big deal. If you buy the candy bar and you're like, oh my God, this is terrible. You just throw it away. No big deal. But once you start getting into a, a, a higher involvement product that's a little more pricey, then the consequences of making a bad choice start to go up. And so if I'm going to spend $1,200, that's, you know, that's enough that I'm going to really be thinking about, is this a good investment? Is this worth the money? 
And anybody that's ever bought something and try to be really value oriented and bought a product that's a little bit not of high enough quality and then it breaks right away and you got to buy another one, you've learned that lesson really, really quickly that sometimes if you're too cheap, you actually end up spending more money. So initially, they set the price at $2,245. Now, relatively recently, they have brought the price down three hundred dollars. But when I wrote the when I wrote the case study here, um, which was you know earlier this year, uh, it was still priced at two thousand two hundred and forty five dollars. Now, to overcome sticker shock, one of the ways that we can overcome a price objection is to think about how do people actually consume products and services. The price matters but not that much. When it comes down to, this is my drawing on my background in financial services here, you know that people buy things based upon payments. So if you can make an affordable monthly payment, suddenly the sticker price doesn't become anywhere near as relevant as it, is, as it would be without it. So a significant number of people, if you, again, you offer them a, an easy financing option, you'll suddenly find that the dam bursts and tons of people are willing to buy your product that weren't willing to buy it before because they were scared of the sticker price. So, but once you buy the bike, you, they have an option of 0% financing for 39 months, get you for $58 a month. But that's not all of it. You also need to purchase a monthly subscription of $39. And what that $39 buys you is access to the class content that they stream right to the tablet that's on the bike itself. And you have several instructors with a wide variety of class options. So you get up this morning, you're, you're, you're really motivated, you want, you want to do a high intensity interval workout, they've got a class for you. In fact, they've got hundreds, if not thousands of class options for you. Some were already recorded, some are going on live. You have certain instructors that you like, you can pick and choose which instructors that you wanna work out with. Yesterday, you were, you were really all gung-ho on working out, but today you're a little sore, but you still wanna work out a little bit. Maybe today you get on and you're like, you know what? I wanna do, do an 80s rock ride, or I wanna do a 90s ride, or a pop ride, or a club bangers ride, or my personal favorite, which I'm willing to admit, yacht rock. I love me some Yacht Rock. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm willing, you can jump on and they have a number of themed rides. In fact, they even have rides um, that are music, that are certain artist oriented, Lady Gaga, uh, 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 Prince, they had a number of different artists that, that are there. And they also have uh, music themed rides in that they've had a Hamilton ride, they've had uh, the Greatest Showman ride, they've had a number of these. So you can really kind of pick and choose what you need to be engaged with today and what motivates you today. So it gives you some variety to try to fit, to try to help develop those healthy habits so that it's not the same thing every day. And the, and the instructors, some days I'm in the mood for a certain instructor and other days I like a different instructor. I do definitely have a favorite, but I don't go to that same instructor every single time. So the idea here is that we can build engagement by offering consumers a little bit more, uh, more options than they might otherwise have at the local gym or the local studio. At the local gym, the spin class is at this time, this is the instructor, and then this is what the content's going to be. Don't like it? Tough. Now, we also need to recognize that there are some individuals that are interested in a Peloton, and the Peloton class content, the quality of the classes is very, very high. And so they're interested in the classes, but they're still hung up on the bike. Or maybe they have a stationary bike at home, or they have another bike that they're just not really quite interested in. And so they also have the option of going with an application uh, on their tablet or their phone or whatever for $12.99 a month. And so they don't have to buy the bike, but they can have access to the class content that, co that costs the bike owners $39. So those are some of the channels we have. Now, they also have some other products, but we're not going to focus in on those today. They've got a treadmill, um, and that, that's content for maybe another class. So first off, let's consider whether it's too expensive. And I think that one of the reasons that we want to know and understand segmentation, targeting, and positioning is that we have to recognize what I like to call the nature argument. 
the one of the things that makes the fitness space kind of interesting to study is that you will, no matter what price you set your product at, you will always have somebody who complains that it's too expensive. And why is that? Because why don't you just go outside and lift some heavy rocks? Or why not just go run around the house? Like literally, like around the house. Like, come on, just run that. Just keep doing laps. You don't need to buy a treadmill. And again, weightlifting, why pay for that? There's a heavy rock outside. Just keep lifting that thing. So this opens up this space to really want to understand on a deeper level what it is that compels people. And is it price? Well, the nature argument starts to kind of undermine the idea that price is the primary driver. It becomes much more complex. But we also have to understand that we have upper bounds. We can't just charge anything we want. I mean, we can't charge $248,000 like, like an amazing kitchen robot would be uh, because nobody can afford that. So there's a limit as to what we, can, what we can charge. So who are our customers? What can they afford? And what are their alternatives? So we want to ask ourselves in value-based pricing, what is the customer actually paying for? What is it that they want? What drives their decision? What drives their engagement? If we think back to things like high-end spas, yes, they've got workout equipment, but they've got a massage area and maybe a little bar restaurant area with some health food and all that sort of stuff. And I sometimes will jokingly say, I'm not sure just how much fitness even occurs in some of those really high-end spas because it's a place where people like go hang out and they make sure that like all their workout gear completely matches and everybody looks like really good. Like they, like they spend a lot of time getting around to go to the gym where you're supposed to get all sweaty and nasty, but seemingly nobody's sweaty and nasty at these places. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, <laughs> lifting a calf every day. <laughs> I like that one too. Uh, so what we want to understand is that when people engage in buying fitness, it's as much about the experience is, as it is the product itself. In fact, the experience is more than the product itself. They pay for the experience. And so other firms like Lululemon, for example, Lululemon understood this a while back in that, hey, if you focus in on people that do yoga, they do yoga in a classroom setting. And guess what? If you get the person who instructs the class in yoga, and I'm assuming you guys know Lululemon, stretchy black yoga pants that makes everybody's behind look fantastic. And I do mean everybody. Um, if the yoga instructor's wearing those fantastic behind looking pants, in a couple of weeks, everybody's wearing those. And so there's a relationship, an experience dimension. And so Peloton is about trying to create an, an immersive experience at home. Can I feel connected to a group at home alone? And so with the class content of a Peloton, you have the instructors, the intensity of the workout, they're giving you encouragement. They also have the music. It's an experience. And in fact, I jokingly say this, which maybe Tim will back me up on this one, maybe at least when he first had it, it's almost a party. Uh, Tim, does that, does that seem like a fair assessment? Or did you find that at all, just out of curiosity? Maybe not. I know I, I took them off. Okay. So, oh, okay. Okay. Excellent. So yeah. So it's not just me saying it. You got a couple of folks who have them. I mean, it's like a freaking party. And uh, Tim might know this one. Like I'm a big fan of, of Jen Sherman and, uh, and she's been around there for a while. So a couple of folks will know that one. Those of you don't, that's, she's an instructor. So when we come down to setting our price, we want to think about what are people getting? So number one, what I call the indirect time cost. If I were to ask you, last time you flew on a plane, how long, how long did it get, how long did it take you to get there? I bet 95% of you would tell me the flight time. And you will conveniently ignore the time it took to pack your bag, load the car, the traffic to get across the, you know, I'm in Hayward, so traffic to get across the bridge, drive up to San Francisco, get out, go through, um, you know, go through security checks wait for the plane, then fly, then get off. If you check the bag, you got to get the bag. I mean, suddenly a three hour flight actually took six and a half hours. And so we have that with the Peloton here. How much time do you lose packing your bag and going to the gym and the time to get back? I will admit, I once was a, a member of Orange Theory Fitness. Again, clearly not. I didn't stick with it long enough. Um, Orange Theory Fitness 
in that I had to drive over to where the studio was. It was a great workout, but at the same time, I also had to come back. And if I was running a little behind some morning, boy, was it easy to justify not going. It was really, really easy. So the Peloton excels on a convenience dimension. I can choose when I want to work out, how long I want to work out, the instructor that I want to work with, the content, the style of class, and even the music in some respects. So if I normally work out for an hour in the morning and I'm running a little behind, don't worry, they got you, boo. Get you behind on that bike for 45 minutes. Can't, don't have time for a 45 minute class, do a 30 minute class. Don't have enough time for 30 minute class. And it goes down and increments all the way down even to like five and 10 minute kind of stretching warm up. We also have the vanity dimension in that I can be, an, and if anybody's ever taken a spin class, and this is where I'll look to, to, to Tim and, uh, and to Brooke, I think we can chime in on this one. I'm willing to admit it. Ain't got no shame in my game, baby. When I ride out of Peloton class, there is a pool of sweat below the bike. You think I fell in a dunk tank of sweat. It's disgusting, okay? I, I know that's art you guys didn't want commissioned, but it's disgusting. <laughs> and you know what? I don't know that I want, I mean, you know, I'm a pretty calm, cool, collected, confident individual, but at the same time, I don't know that I want everyone to see me when I'm in my absolute sweatiest, nastiest, most ex exhausted. I don't need to worry about that. Ain't nobody gonna see me. You can work out, you, you can work out on that nasty t-shirt that you've had that's got you know holes all over it. I mean, it can be just disgusting. You don't have to worry about having all that stuff. Then we also have what are the comparable costs? How much would I spend for these alternatives? How much is my gym membership? So if we just look at the price of the Peloton, the price of the bike plus the price of the, you know, the $58 a month to, to finance the bike plus $39 a month for the class content, it might seem like it's actually pretty expensive. But, you know, just a standard gym or even a spa membership can sometimes run you as much as $250 a month. Yes, there are places like 24 hour fitness that are much less expensive, but once you start to factor in the indirect time costs, suddenly the price might not be quite so bad. And then lastly, Peloton is a brand leader in this space. Sure, I could buy a non-Peloton bike, but what happens if I don't use it? Who's going to want to buy it? Who am I going to sell it to? I might end up with it sitting at a garage sale and I might, I, I could maybe spend a thousand dollars on a bike, but then I can only sell it for $50 at a garage sale. The Peloton is robust in the power of its brand in that if you don't buy, if you don't um, use it, you can sell it and usually sell it really quickly and also for almost as much as you paid for it. So in some respects, it's not, it might not be too expensive at all. So the question I want you to think about, and I am going to prompt you into some, into some breakout rooms here in just a couple minutes here, is start to think about pricing and value. And is the Peloton bike too expensive or not expensive enough? And so one of the other things that I think is a value dimension we want to, we want to emphasize here, my significant other and I, I say significant other because I'm the better half, um, her and I used to have uh, memberships to uh, city sports but we each had to pay for that membership. And lo and behold, I wasn't using it all that much, but we each had it. The Peloton, the memberships are tied to the bike. Now this is something really, really significant from a case study and an academic analytical perspective in that up to six individuals can have an account on that bike for that same $39 cost. So the $58 plus the $39 if I'm single by myself, you might be like, well, that might seem maybe a little, a little pricey. But if you have another person that lives with you or a family and they want to use the bike as well, well, then the price of that bike starts to come down because you don't actually have to pay any more money to add them onto the bike. It's like those freeloaders on your Netflix account. Um, you don't have to pay any more. You just add them on there, freeloaders. Um, then lastly, and this is the other part, which we're not going to focus in on here today, and this is a this is a major thrust of the case, is that we want to understand the brand community. Peloton has created a community where people feel connected to other users. And that brand community starts to create this interaction dynamic that encourages and reinforces continued use and engagement with the product. And in that space, we have what's known as tribes. 
tribes have formed. And what are these? These are groups that have actually organized across social media platforms to almost be a business and a brand within a business. And so in the case study, I happen to focus in on just one of them, known as the Swexy Swarm. It's a sweaty, sexy swarm. So they call it the Swexy Swarm. I know it's pretty clever. Uh, the Swexy Swarm is now up to something like, I think nearly 40,000 people are a part of the Swexy Swarm. And the Swexy Swarm sponsors uh, philanthropic giving engagements. They even do well, prior to COVID-19, they even did in-person meetups. So they had some people uh, come out to San Francisco here and they went out for a night and there's a bunch of uh, uh, pictures of them posting and they've gone to some other cities and, and had you know meetups and whatnot. So people are finding engagement in building friends across this channel, this bike, and they're meeting and engaging with others alone. And so creating kind of that contradiction of you know together alone. So with COVID-19, what has happened is Peloton is growing very rapidly, but COVID-19 has created a new problem. Suddenly, people who are interested in a Peloton, suddenly they can't work out at their local gym anymore. And so demand for the Peloton bikes has skyrocketed such that um, in some cases it's taken three to four months to actually get delivery of the bike, creating certain challenges for the brand itself. It's so popular that the, that the that the dynamics, the, the operations and the scaling of the operation, they're having a hard time keeping up. And so that creates a bit of a weakness. And with that being said, the classes used to be uh, filmed in their New York studio. And so you felt like, even though you were at home, you felt like with the screen and the music, you felt like you were actually in that studio with them, even though you knew you weren't. But with COVID-19, they, they had to shut that down. And recently they have gone back into the studio, but now the instructors are being filmed in an empty studio because they can't have others there. So it's created a, a few challenges. So we're gonna switch over into uh, some breakout rooms here momentarily, but I thought I would kind of emphasize just a couple of dynamics um, that we have with uh, HALT and our programs that I think are a little unique um, across universities. In particular, I mention these because I do teach, I have taught at some other universities as well. And that is, you know, we do expect um, that it's an experiential uh, learning environment. You are a very active member in the class and in the lectures. And in fact, we have some student ambassadors that are here. And I at least know one of them can speak, speak to it because she took, uh, she took my uh, uh, project management class here recently. So Nicola, I'll let her chime in uh, in a moment here on that. But this is not uh, an experience where you come into the classroom and I lecture at you and you passively just absorb it and then vomit it back on you know, test day or term project day or anything like that. It is a definitely, I actually call it a three-way street. It's back and forth between you, between me, and what's the third way? Between your classmates. The experiences and perspectives that they have and with the international uh, uh, dimension that we have at HALT that is unique. And I say inter unique in that, uh, if any of you have ever studied internationally or, or did a study abroad program and maybe with, during your undergrad, you might, this might resonate with you. And for those of you that haven't, well, just play, you know, just play along here a little bit. At most universities, you do have the option to study abroad, but there'll be a very limited number of schools that you can go to and you have to apply to that school. You have to get accepted. You then have to look at their classes. You then have to try to get a spot in one of those classes. You then have to get the syllabus from that class, send it back to your home school, have the department chairs actually look at the syllabus, see that the syllabus matches up eh, pretty close. And they'll say, okay, you're allowed to go ahead and take those courses. If the syllabus doesn't match up, they'll say, well, you can still take the course. We're just not going to give you credit for it, which wants to do that. Um, and so it creates this really kind of a cumbersome dynamic. But since we have campuses around the world, um, to, to take a class from Holt SF versus a Holt London versus Holt Dubai, it's all Holt. So that kind of cumbersome dynamic just isn't even there. And so also, we have this kind of a holistic approach. And, and Nicola can, can chime in on this one. Um, I oftentimes say, I provide a service, you are my product. And so it's teaching you the content of the course, but it's also some of those kind of value added things. You know, I, I teach with case studies that I like, I like to use. So it's not just teach you a theory and a framework, it's let's, let's have you some real 
current perspectives on how to apply this stuff and also be talking about, you know, what other soft skills do you need to develop so that you can be professional, so that you can be upwardly mobile in your careers? Because let's be honest, I bet a lot of you are considering grad school with the idea that this is going to give you some skills and capabilities to get to where it is that you want to be or some goals. And so we really take a perspective on that, really thoughtful of, okay, what do you need to get ahead? What do you need to get ahead of everybody else? So a couple, so the last thing before I hand this off here is that is emphasizing some things that I think are a real standout. And that is some of the dynamic course curricula. So I know a number of you had mentioned that you're actually here in the Bay Area. Um, I do teach at HALT, but it's, it's not a big secret. I also teach at San Francisco State. And I will tell you this, why am I saying that is to, is to give you this perspective here, is that HALT has a dynamic course curriculum that other schools just don't have or won't have for several years. So uh, we have classes like corporate diplomacy. I will tell you this one right now. Um, we have a corporate diplomacy class, which is really kind of aimed at bridging the divide between things like stakeholder engagement and corporate social responsibility. And how do you actually put it into practice? How do you actually engage with a community as well as your shareholders and employees and managers? How do you convince the local community that you want to build a new factory, which is going to, build, going to bring in, I don't know, new jobs? And you say, well, doesn't everybody want new jobs? Yeah, but if the community is not, the people that are going to live across the street from the community don't plan to actually work at your factory, they might not be so keen on your factory being built. In fact, they might be kind of upset about it. And so how do you engage with that? Corporate diplomacy is a class that many public institutions will start offering in probably another, probably four to six years. So HALT's curriculum has classes that are really on the cutting edge of what it is that you need to get ahead. And so um, that's something I think is a real uh, a, a value to mention that again, competing programs, they just don't have it. And that's why I mentioned San Francisco State because I, I do teach there uh, occasionally. And um, they're not gonna have that class for several years. It's just not gonna happen um, because of the processes and procedures. So uh, with that being said, I think that um, I just wanna share with you my contact information that you guys can contact me for anything that you might uh, want to chat about or any curiosities. I open myself up for that. But I will say this is in my closing comments before I hand this over um, to our student ambassadors here for the breakout rooms is that the Peloton at a $2,200 price point might seem very expensive. And I think until you understand who it might be targeted at it probably is expensive. And you're going to be asked to think about who you might target with this. And I'm going to rob you of one answer right now. There's one very obvious group of consumers that the Peloton is targeted at. So this will be one of the answers you, you, you can't use. And that is, who might be some of Peloton's closest competitors? Soul Cycle. Soul Cycle creates kind of the experience dimension that Peloton is trying to offer remotely. But the problem is, is that SoulCycle, while being popular, is constrained by their location. Now, if you happen to work right next to a SoulCycle studio, you'd be like, well, that ain't no thing. But if you live halfway across town, that's kind of a pain. Also, SoulCycle, people that go to SoulCycle love SoulCycle. Here's the problem though. They only have so many bikes in the studio. One of the reasons I don't work out at Orange Theory Fitness anymore is because when they first opened their studio, I was able to get in there right away. But then as the studio became more popular, the weekend workout sessions filled right up. In fact, it got to the point that if you didn't book your workout a week and a half in advance, well, then I'm sorry, you're just, uh, you're just out of luck. There's no spot for you. And so the Peloton doesn't have that problem. And so in many respects, like when they did the Lady Gaga ride, they had, I think it was 70,000 people all riding live in that class at once. They were all engaged uh, in that. And so the Peloton in looking at their price might seem kind of expensive, but if you think that the Peloton is kind of aimed at the person who'd go to a soul cycle, well then actually the Peloton might be underpriced because 
the price for a drop-in class at Peloton at a Soul Cycle is about thirty-five dollars per class. So if you're going to work out three to four times per week, well, then if you work out four times a week, you're spending almost I mean just shy of six hundred dollars every month. And so suddenly, you could argue that maybe the Peloton should actually be more expensive. And so that kind of a walkthrough in a very condensed uh, time frame here is to kind of introduce you to Peloton and what the idea of what value-based pricing is. And hopefully we can encourage you guys to interact with each other and engage a little bit more.